you could say we're the most followed brand on TikTok in Australia. <laughs> Does it make our customer laugh? Does it make them pissed off? Does it make them rally together and say, fuck them? Ultimately, that's just me. It's just who I am. And so why would I try and hide that? Welcome to Add to Cart, Australia's leading e-commerce podcast that express delivers all you need to know in the fast-moving world of online retail. Every week, Nathan Bush from eSuite and an e-commerce industry expert will share the news, research and insights that you need to know to keep you at the top of your game. And of course, keep your customers adding to cart. Today's guest has the most TikTok followers of any brand in Australia, 6 million TikTok followers. And no, it's not Nike. It's not Culture Kings, and no, it's not Addicart, it's Ovira. Alice Williams is the founder of Ovira, a period pain relief device. Now, I've known Alice for a while now, and I always love chatting to her because whenever you have an inkling of what she's going to say or do, she flips it on you and presents something in a whole new light. And that's exactly what she and the team are doing at Ovira. They're making the conversation around periods, vaginas, women's health normal, because it should be. In this chat, we cover how Alice stumbled across the device that ended up becoming the Ovira device, but we also cover how they got to 6 million TikTok followers. We talk about their creative content strategy when it comes to Facebook ads and her tips for getting favorable PR. If you are in marketing in an e-commerce or retail brand, this is a must listen to. Alice will absolutely shake up the way that you look at the world. I will warn you right up front that there's some swearing in this episode by me included. So if you are offended by sweary words or heaven forbid, lots of talk about vaginas, you might want to switch over. For the rest of you, if you're like me, you're going to love it. One quick message from me. At eSuite, we've just launched a range of e-commerce learning products and courses. These include the foundations of e-commerce, such as customer experience and returns modules. They're designed to be done on your own time and on demand. We're also doing regular lunch and learns on a Friday. So jump over to esuitetalent.com.au if you want to check them out for yourself or your team to upskill in e-commerce. All right, let's get into it. Thanks to our partners, Shopify Plus and Paclio, here's our conversation with Alice Williams, founder of Ovira. (laughs) Alice, welcome to Add to Cart. Thanks for having me, Nath. Let's do this. Oh, no, it's been a while. We've been planning this, I feel like, for six months. I think it's even longer. (laughs) I think you have been very patient. And I'm going to even say it was over a year ago that you asked me to come on this. So what's been going on in the last year that um, has been more important than me? Not much, really. (laughs) (laughs) Just terrible on email. (laughs) That's fair. That's fair. All right. I know your story and I love your story. But for those who may not have come across Ovira, can you explain who Ovira is and and what your mission is? Sure. We are a Aussie-born women's health brand focusing on period care. And our mission is to end the unnecessary suffering of women everywhere. The first problem that we're solving is period pain. And we do this through a small wearable device based on a TENS machine. Yeah. And how'd you come across that machine? So I don't have a background in business or marketing or anything like that. But what I do have is horrendous period pain. And I would love researching other ways to treat my pain. I did study health sciences. So I would love looking at literature and seeing like what research was out there, whether it could be like Cairo or infrared sauna or different supplements and so on. And one of the things I came across was electrotherapy or TENS machines. They're not revolutionary technology. This has been around since the 80s. And there is a lot of research out there about how it can help women specifically with dysmenorrhea or period pain. And I was like, why haven't I heard of this before? You know, it's instant relief that doesn't harm the body. Surely this is too good to be true. Tried it, found it did work, was like, what the fuck? It actually works. And is this going to cause cancer in 10 years time? Is that like, there's no hidden secrets. Like it really is as good as it sounds. And so that kind of took me on this yeah, crazy journey to where we are today. So for someone like me in our previous chats who hadn't seen what a tense machine is, can you describe what it looks like? 
and what it is? Yeah, sure. It's a small handheld device. Ours is the size of an egg, but super flat and discreet. So you can clip it onto your pants or your bra, depending on what you're wearing. And then it's got two sticky pads connected with two cords to the device that you can stick on wherever you have the worst pain. And they send little vibrations that kind of feel like a phone vibrating in your pocket that are overloading the nerves and stopping the pain signals from going to your brain. No signals, no pain. (laughs) No signals, no pain. And tell me, I bet that you went on your journey with Ovira and discovering the relief that it can give you. And I, I, I expect that it changes your life. Have you seen that with your customers as well going on that journey? Oh, definitely. You know, we have customers who cry their eyes out as soon as they try the device. We have customers who email us saying they even cried at the checkout process, which is funny. (laughs) It's called add to cart. (laughs) In a good way or a bad way? In a good way. They're like, I didn't even know it was possible for a brand and product to talk to me like Avira does. And women are really suffering when it comes to period pain. Like we did a survey recently with about 1,200 Australian women that showed that 98% of them are experiencing pain and over half of those women's pain is bad enough that they're not able to complete daily tasks. Like that's huge. That's massive. Yeah. And do you find that a lot of women kind of just grin and bear it? Is that the thing? Because people don't know what's out there? Definitely. I think because there is unfortunately still a lot of shame and stigma around periods that it has just kind of been automated that we do grin and bear it. We've never really, I guess, even known to speak up because we've never seen other people do it. I think now that's definitely changing. You know, when I have a condition called endo and when I grew up, I didn't even know endometriosis existed. So how was I even supposed to ask my doctor, do I have this, you know? Yeah. And in terms of doctors and the medical world, how do you get credibility and trust when you first introduce customers to Ovira? Because it sounds like too easy, right? Yeah, it's interesting because we thought health professionals like doctors and so on were going to be really important in getting our customers to convert, but it actually does the opposite. Like there is a strong distrust towards the medical industry and doctors more generally. And like we saw this in the survey results too, as in I think it was something like 60% had had a bad experience with their doctor when they'd spoken to them about their pain and walked away feeling at a loss. So that's massive. That's more than half of women. And when we test, including a doctor as someone who promotes this or vouches for it, we don't really see results. So ultimately, I mean, trust the data. They don't give a shit. Yeah, right. So it feels like you've got a community of women who are almost like, well, fuck it. I'll solve this myself. Definitely. You know, what we do see is that they trust each other. And so friend to friend is super strong. I mean, like most brands, right? Word of mouth. But, you know, we have an incredible online community. We've got a Facebook group of, I think, over 14,000 users or members or people who just love Avira more broadly. They're kind of like our VIP group. We love them. And then we've got, obviously, millions of followers across socials. So our community exists everywhere. It exists in real life. It exists on Facebook. It exists on other social channels like TikTok. We don't care. (laughs) I love that you casually dropped in, like, yeah, we've obviously got millions of followers on social channels and we've probably got business owners going, what, what What? was that little bit that you just said? You've become TikTok famous. Is that right? We have, yeah. I mean, you could say we're the most followed brand on TikTok in Australia. <laughs> is that true? It is. Yes, we are. We, are, we have the largest following in Australia on TikTok. Why? Because we make great content and people ask, how did you do it? Like, what's the secret to the algorithm? And, you know, I'm very bad at most things, but TikTok, because I started it with who Shanky on our team, who's incredible. We did it together for the first few weeks and months. And we were maniacs, like we got hyper obsessed with it. And if there's one thing I do understand extremely well, it's organic TikTok content. And yeah, going back to when people ask, like, what's the trick with the algorithm and posting time and all of these things, like they're one percenters. Like the thing that's going to move the needle, the 90 percenter, is making content people are going to watch. And it's, you know, I speak about this all the time when people reach out or on other podcasts, I swear, of what is great content. TikTok will tell you, go and scroll on the For You page and look what's coming up there. 
99% of the time, it's not brands. And that's because brands are making content that worked on Instagram five years ago. It's pretty, it's brand, it's a vibe, but it's fucking boring to watch. And it's never going to come up on the For You page. And they also try and stick to their brand guidelines. And when you're making content for TikTok, like you have to put the rule book in the bin and do whatever the hell is going to work. And if it's working, it means people are having an affinity with your brand. They like watching it. As long as you're not causing huge controversy, which, hey, a little bit of that is fine, then, yeah, (laughs) there's not really a secret. Ever scrolled through an e-commerce packaging website for fun? Nah, me neither. Until today. Paclio is putting the joy into the packaging game. So let's play a game. I'll tell you the name of the Paclio product and you have to try and guess what kind of product they are. Fairy Floss. Compostable Mailer. Queen Bee. Honeycomb Padded Mailer. Here we go. Gummy Shark. Water Activated Tape. Now, if my jaded self thinks that this packaging is fun, imagine what your customers will think. Paclio is also eco-friendly, Australian-owned and operated with same-day dispatch and 14-day returns. Now, that's pure joy for everyone. Check out the Paclio range of e-commerce packaging options at paclio.com. That's paclio, P-A-C-K-L-E-O, paclio.com. So when you first started playing around with TikTok, where was your head at at that point before you got your 6 million followers? I should know this, Nathan, because I listen to your podcast all the time, but I'm sure other people on your podcast have spoken about the privacy laws that came in recently. And I guess it changed the way a lot of e-com brands approach marketing in general, because when we launched, it was the golden days of Facebook. You could put up anything and Facebook would know who your customer was and it would convert. So we could put up a terrible ad and Facebook would know exactly who our customer was. And so they would convert. And it wasn't because we were good at creative. It was because Facebook was incredible and you'd literally just press a button, chuck up some ads. And suddenly that changed and it didn't work anymore. And so we were like, what are we going to do? And we were like, let's test all different things. And we did. And one of the things that we tested was TikTok. And when I say tested TikTok, I'd never even been on TikTok before and no one in the team have. So (laughs) I feel very old hanging out on a platform like that. But we just jumped in headfirst. And I think, I don't know, we're posting like one video a day and doing trends like what most people do when they first get on the platform. But one of our videos did happen to go viral. I think it got like 40 million views and it was a device video. And we saw our traffic just go like, pew. And we were like, well, there's something in this. And like those people were converting, like it was a high quality audience, which don't get me wrong, just because a video goes viral, you will get a lot of shit traffic too. But because we saw that, we were like, we want to see that again. And so we kept trying to repeat that. But obviously, TikTok is a hungry beast and it likes new content. So we have to diversify very quickly. And just posting product stuff, you might go viral once because it's the first time TikTok has seen your product. But then after that, you've got to innovate and it's not going to be about the product. So how much time do you spend with your team thinking about all different types of content that you create versus actually just getting in and doing it? So we do zero planning, zero. Uh, zero calendar planning, don't use any of those apps, nothing. That's so cool. And how do you or do you set boundaries around the types of content? Because obviously you've got Ovira as a product, but then you've got your broader mission around, you know, helping women through pain in general. Sorry, I worded that pretty badly. But then you've also got your personal story, your team story, your business story, everything else around it. Do you put boundaries around what kind of content you'll go live with or do you just go, oh, idea here, idea here, idea here? Well, there you go, Nate. Like you just mentioned like eight different areas we can make content. Why wouldn't we create eight channels and make eight different styles of content that's going to appeal to, you know, all different types of people? So like there is so much we can do and that's why we don't put boundaries on it. And it's like there is so much variation. And so when we go to make TikToks, we set ourselves a time limit. And so at the moment, like, I should say, for example, Shanky's making content, she'll set herself a time limit for one hour and make 15 videos in that hour. And so when she rocks up, she's got no plans about what to do. She'll just pick up her phone and scroll through, like it could be the comment section, gives great inspo, and then pump them out, upload it straight away. It's no approval process. How good is that TikTok sprints? 
TikTok sprints, exactly right. And so it's only really an hour of the day that you're doing TikTok. And like, we get a billion views a month. We get tens of thousands of comments a day. Like we're not monitoring it. We're not scrolling. And like, if you had the notification thing live, I'm pretty sure your phone would run out of battery in 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and so obviously the content part is key. And I think a lot of people get caught up in talking about, oh, geez, what, how much content, what kind of content can we create? What about the other side of it around managing comments, communities, getting back to people? Is that a huge part of TikTok? Uh, not necessarily. The comment section kind of becomes its own entertainment piece in itself. It actually can be funnier than the video. You know, there's one video that went viral recently of ours and someone duetted it and the original video was talking about how a woman's vagina inside, it can be all different shapes and sizes, which is why some people like using, a, you know, a period cup or a tampon and so on. And someone duetted the video and, you know, it showed us being like in the background showing the inside of all different vaginas and then they told the story of their vagina and they're going, here's the swimming pool, here's the dark, dirty entrance and it was hilarious, but the comment section in that was funnier than the video. You know, people commenting saying, mine has a psych ward, you know, like just hilarious things. And that's just TikTok is I love it because it's not like what Instagram now is, which is like everyone being politically correct. It's all just the Twitter crowd on there now. Like I can't stand it. It's so boring. Whereas like TikTok is just like, do whatever, say whatever, like, let's just have a laugh. Yeah. Do you ever get people offended? Oh, all the time. Yeah. I mean, when you're having like 1 billion views, that's hundreds of millions of people that are watching your content. Of course not. And I mean, like our content's going viral in countries where you have to recognize that the culture maybe isn't as progressive as we are here with women's rights. And like, who are we to get on a stand and talk about vaginas so openly? A lot of people don't like that. <laughs> How dare you talk about vaginas? Correct. Like, how dare we talk openly about women's health and try and educate women about their bodies? You know, there are women, to pull it back to basics, who don't even realize that they have three holes down there and their whole life they've gone or they're trying to insert a tampon into the wrong hole. And I mean, this may sound crazy, but this is actually the large majority of women who've grown up not knowing anything about their bodies. How do you feel when you hear stories like that? It pisses me off. Like, it really does, you know. For myself, when I grew up and got my period, I remember just being so ashamed, like feeling this really heavy weight. And, you know, if the girls found out in school, you got your period, you were bullied. <laughs> like that was the reaction people had, which is nuts, right? Like a period allows us to do the most incredible act there is. It allows us to create human life inside of us. And I don't want to take away from the fact that it's really shit. <laughs> it can be really painful. It's a pain in the ass. If you've got stuff on, it makes you bloated and all the things. But ultimately, like, hey, that's pretty cool. Like, that is one of the most incredible acts as humankind we can do. So why is it that we find these things, like, so disgusting? And, I mean, even period blood in itself, if, if you cut your finger knife as a kid, what does your mum tell you to do? Suck on your finger, right? But period blood, oh, no, wow. And, like, Let's be real, period blood, like those cells are the smartest cells in our body, like allows us to create human life. And unless you have a blood-borne disease, there's nothing disgusting or bad about it, ultimately. I mean, sure, you don't need to drink it. But... <laughs> this isn't hell. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not even going down that path. I'm not going down there. Um... <laughs> That's fantastic. Do you feel that obviously with the impact that you're making on TikTok and I'm assuming reaching a lot of younger women, but yourself and there's a lot of other people out there doing it as well, do you feel the younger generations coming through will be having different conversations in the schoolyard than perhaps you would have at that age? 100%. Like Gen Z is incredible in the way that they're just so switched on, you know? They're so in touch with social issues, what's right and what's wrong, and really thinking for themselves. Like, all of them are quite unique, whereas when I was younger, you know, don't get me wrong, like, there's always, like, trends that go through in, like, what people wear and, like, all of those things, but I just think they're so different. Like, for example, I saw, and I can't remember what school it was, but, like, shout out to the girls, a high school where the girls decided to protest because the male teachers 
um, had been telling them that their skirts were too short. And so why are we sexualizing women's bodies? And why are we putting the onus on the students? Why are men looking at young girls' legs in the classroom? And so they did this huge protest about, like, that's enough. We're not taking this anymore. And, like, that's amazing. I swear, like, my generation would not have done that. Yeah, 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 absolutely. That is amazing. And do you get many young women reaching out to you as, like, a role model for this? Because you're very public now in TikTok. Like, you're a celebrity, right? Like, do you get people who are wanting to reach out to you to kind of get your advice or your input? Nah, people don't like me. (laughs) I don't (laughs) give a shit about me. (laughs) Well, funny, like, yeah, I am obviously have a presence. Like, we have a presence and obviously it's a brand, but I actually keep my private life quite separate. So I never post, like, you won't find a thing about me unless it's, like, in PR or a podcast or so on. But when it comes to, like, social media, like, I'm actually not putting myself out there. And I've done this intentionally because I love what I do at Avira. And I like making content with Avira, but I never want that to come into my personal life because like you've heard when I go all in on something, I'm making 30 to 40 videos a day and get obsessed. And so I can't, I just can't add on another layer of doing it in my private life. Yeah, that makes sense. So TikTok's up and running, great team running it. It's pumping along. What are you obsessed with at the moment? I'm obsessed with Facebook ads. What? Which will shock people. But the obsession is real and we were obsessed with Facebook ads in the early days. Vic's on my team, bless her. She, her and I used to pump out about 60 ads a week together and that obsession is back big time. And so we thought Facebook was broken, which was a big area. And if anyone's listening to this and thinking it is, I would challenge that completely because people are still going on it, Facebook and Instagram. It's changed. So the way you have to approach it is different. Because now you have to make a really good ad because Facebook isn't going to show it to your customer. So how do we, like, suddenly you have to be extremely good at creative. Not that you didn't before, but I would say even more now. And it's so interesting, like, scrolling through it. If you go onto Facebook and Instagram, no one's advertising. It's all the dropshippers Mm. because they're very good at making ads. So what does a really good ad on Facebook look like today that's different to what it looked like three years ago? So previously, we could have just uploaded a piece of UGC, like literally taken a screenshot of exactly and, you know, put some average copy with it. But now, like, you really have to work hard. So we do a lot of, um, I mean, like, this this isn't anything new, but video creative of storytelling. And so I would say, like, again, Nath, everything I'm saying is not revolutionary, but having a really strong thumb stopper, so the first one to three seconds, it's the same on TikTok because people scroll so quickly. And then a great storytelling piece, you know, can you create FOMO? So mentioning something like, oh, it's selling out again, ending with, you know, making sure people clicking through to the website. We're also finding that sometimes not kind of the opposite of what you've been taught as a marketer of like, get across the product, you know, in the first three seconds, all of those things, like doing the opposite and making it look like an organic piece of content that you'd come across on TikTok and then somehow introducing the product somewhere so the consumer doesn't even realize they're watching an ad. It's just like a normal video in feed. Okay, so it's not shiny creative. It's still a little bit... Oh, never shiny creative. Like ugly, ugly ads. (laughs) Make ugly shit. (laughs) (laughs) Make ugly shit because it's... Again, throw out your brand guidelines, stop romancing, and just get down and dirty with it. Oh, wow. And do you put much effort into targeting on Facebook now? (sighs) In what way? As in trying to find your customer yourself, or do you let Facebook take the reins and do a lot of the targeting for you? both we are using advantage plus but we find that you can't really scale it as much like i mean how aggressive do you want to be sure i'm sure if you're with an agency they've probably just got advantage plus on and it's like oh it's working great la 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 but they could definitely be doing more (laughs) and so we still you know use regular campaigns like when we're creative testing or we'll just leave stuff on like we're very very chaotic and we can probably even be more chaotic in what we do So ignore your account managers when they say simplify your campaigns, ignore all of that. And, you know, have we've got multiple accounts now. And yeah, we're just constantly testing shit, trying different interests, like everything, everything and anything. If it's making us money, we don't care. 
I can't wait to get the emails and the LinkedIn messages from agency owners who are like, uh, all my clients have just told me that they need to be more chaotic and it's all your fault. I hope the clients message you too and say, hey, we should never use an agency because in the e-com brand, you're outsourcing your most important piece. And so, yeah, don't use agencies pretty much. <laughs> so tell me about that because obviously we're in the game of, of talent and connecting retailers to great talent. We found over COVID that growth marketers, especially in performance, were really hard to come across. And if you wanted an example of anyone who had stupid pay rises, performance marketers and developers were the hot ones, right? Mm -hmm. How do you manage that if you've got all of that in-house? How do you attract and keep that hot talent? I mean, you'll have to ask my staff who've been with me from the start. Like, why do you still work for Alice? She's horrible. <laughs> like, is that what you're asking me? <laughs> no, I'm just saying that it can be expensive to keep in-house and not easy, right? Well, let's rewind. I would even say that now that I do it and have become okay with it, is the best kept secret is performance marketing isn't that hard. And so if you're hiring a performance marketer, what are you getting from that? Like, and you're paying them a big salary and, you know, they've come from one of the big names, five to 10 years experience. What are you getting? Because performance marketing isn't a performance marketing play. It's a creative play. And most performance marketers are horrendous at creative. And so for us is I don't hire performance marketers and I don't hire video editors. It's one role. It's growth. And you're in the account doing the performance marketing and you're making the creative. And I think that's where e-com will go because the platforms are broken. They don't work like they used to. And I mean, you've just heard us talking about the way we approach it. You don't have to be smart. Like it's literally silly stuff that works. Like actually the sillier, the better. And the more naive you are, the better of just try random shit. And if it sticks, go all in, you know, that's 15%. And then the other majority is creative velocity and quality. And you don't get that from a performance marketer. And so your philosophy is just get in there, get your hands dirty, play with the tools, get results on the board, whether they're good or bad, and we'll keep moving. That's how you learn and develop in growth. A hundred percent. And don't get me wrong, like we've made a thousand mistakes. And when I hire someone who's never touched TikTok before, they've never touched Facebook ads, I don't on day one, throw them the Ferrari keys and say, off you go, go cruising. You know, we, it's very slow. It's, hey, this is X, Y, and Z. What do you think? And, you know, if it's a good idea, say, cool, go do it. And then get them to come back. How did that go? What did you learn? And so it's a very slow process of slowly showing them how to drive before you give them the keys. And if they fuck up, who cares? You know, when you're moving so fast, you're bound to have mistakes. And so we always make sure that the Vera like mistakes are very safe. It's okay. And one of our best, one of the biggest, you know, like Vicky, for example, accidentally in the early days of Facebook, accidentally turned on, you know, quite a large budget campaign and accidentally targeted men. And it went off. And, you know, if she didn't make that mistake, we never would have known. <laughs> and this is the beauty of Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean as in men buying Avira for their partners? Yeah, of yeah. course. Wow. Of course it makes sense now, doesn't it? Yeah, definitely. I mean, duh. <laughs> <laughs> but, again, like who are we to decide who our customer is? And so that's why you always, like, just want to try something. You never, ever, ever know. Twenty twenty three might be the year that you have to unravel everything that you know about loyalty. New global research from Shopify showed that Australian customers are highly likely to switch brands in order to save money. And here we were thinking loyalty points will keep us together forever. While the battle for customers' hearts will be driven by pricing in twenty twenty three, they will not sacrifice customer service in the process. 2023 might be back to basic retail, but it doesn't mean that the opportunity is any less. Treat them lean and keep them keen, I say. To view more resources to help with your 2023 planning and see how Shopify can take your e-commerce business to the next level, visit shopify.com forward slash au today. 
So when you're looking back on that, whether that be, hey, we just had this TikTok video go viral or we're trying this new campaign that we've never tried before, how do you measure success? Is it all financial or is it engagement metrics? What are the most important metrics for you? It depends on like what we're doing. And this would always change, but we're very against vanity metrics. So it may sound cool that we've got, I think it's like about 6.8 million followers across socials. That sounds pretty cool, right? But if that's not making us money, then that's the silliest thing ever because why am I wasting time making content to gain followers? Because it feels nice. Like it's, you know, like obviously education is a huge part for us and it creates value for our customers but we can't create more education if we're not bringing in money to pay those salaries for our employees so tiktok is for us what works for us is we would focus on followers because one it would mean we would have to upload a shitload of content every single week so velocity and quality was very important and two it means when people are clicking on our content they like it enough to come back and so you know when we're having hundreds of millions of people click on the Avira TikTok profile and seeing they make a period pain relief device and there's their website, there's a good chance that based on the volume of that number that people are going to click through on our website. And we would see that, you know, our followers worked in line with our revenue on TikTok. Again, attribution is just such a shit conversation and it doesn't exist, but do a post-purchase app and see what happens. (laughs) Nice, nice, nice. Because it's a shit conversation, we'll move on. Yeah. (laughs) The I was surprised to read, and I can't remember exactly the timing. It was last year sometime. You, you know, kind of goes against everything. The fuck it. Let's try it and see what happens. You bought a New York Times billboard. How did that come about? It was a fuck it moment. And so we literally turned it around, I think, in 24 hours. People in New York don't sleep. And the guy, it was a Sunday night. And we, this is when obviously those abortion laws were coming into play. And so we saw this happening. And so I was just like, hmm, I'm just going to message some big high rises and say, hey, can I buy a billboard for tomorrow? And they all wrote back. And it was, so when I say it was their Sunday night at like 11 p.m., you know, in New York, they have to hustle hard. And I was like, respect. And majority of them said no, because they don't want to take part in political advertising. You have to imagine that the people that own these billboards are already multi, multi multi-millionaires. But someone said, hey, we'll send the creative across. This The person that owns this is actually the only one who's open. They don't give a shit. And so (laughs) they said like, yeah, we're open to it. Send through the creative, agreed on a price, and then up it goes. What did it say? You're really stretching my memory. <laughs> You'll have to get it up, Nath. All right, we'll find it. We'll put it in the um because there is a news article. Put and it I don't in have the notes. In front of me either. I can't even help you out because I don't have it in front of me. It's funny because I wrote the copy for it, so I should know. <laughs> no, that's all right. We'll put a link in the show notes. Fine, yeah, yeah. It was just kind of like a it was a fuck you to whatever was going on, pretty much. Yeah. I've got one more question about marketing before we move on because I'm keen to hear more about your story in business too. Just on the brand because it caught me when you said about throwing out brand guidelines. But if you look on your website and what you've done so far, you've actually got a beautiful brand, like a really inclusive, honest brand, right? So it's not like fluffy and skirting around the edges. It is you. It is for all women. Where do you decide where to double down on the brand? and create brand and when you let it go. Does that make sense? It does. Because if you did click on our website, you'd be like, she's talking smack. She cares about brand. But there's always exceptions to the rules. So for like website and EDMs is probably the, still we don't have brand guidelines. So there, obviously we want things to look trustworthy and usually quality comes into play. However, everywhere else, It's more of an attention play of people don't know about you yet. They don't care. And so how do we create some affinity with them through creating an emotion and some type of emotion that is activating? So it's usually quite a strong emotion. And back in the day, everyone would create Instagram tiles with quotes that were like quite calming. And so now we try and do stuff which is like, does it make our customer laugh? Does it make them pissed off? Does it make them like the abortion billboard we did rally together and say, fuck them? 
you know, and same with the educational content is like people may find it shocking. It's not shocking. Why are we shocked at it? Because we've never been taught about our bodies before in the way that we talk about it. Yeah, a connection piece for a common mission. Yeah. Common cause. Spot on. Common sense. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well. <laughs> Going to your journey, which I've loved following ever since I met you, because I just think you're a leader who isn't afraid to think outside of the normal challenge things, not always take the, well, this is the consensus, we've got to move this way. But I then read a financial review article in 2020. When I first read, I read the opening line and I was like, oh, shit, I wish I was next to Alice as you were reading this just to get your reaction because it said, I've got it right in front of me. Until a year ago, entrepreneur Alice Williams didn't know what VC meant, had never heard of Series A and did not even realize she was creating a medical device. Like if that was me as a founder, I'm like, financially serious? Like, are you like, what are you, how are you trying to set me up here? How did you feel when you read that? I actually didn't mind. I thought for that was my first ever PR interview that I did. And wowee, they could have made me sound so much more horrendous. Actually, respect to the journal because I read that and I was like, wow, I gave her absolute crickets and like just like I was so nervous and she made me sound really decent. And everyone was like, wow, that's a great article. Oh, so I've read it wrong on your behalf. You have, Nate, but I will say of I've had PR training by someone who I absolutely love. I'll give Brad a shout out. And Brad told me that when I'm talking to media of don't talk yourself down, because exactly that, what you're talking about, is if they run with that and people are seeing it on paper, they're not reading your personality. And exactly what you've read is the response that you would get from someone. Oh, that's really shit. And so, but ultimately, I think like, that's just me. (laughs) You know, it's just who I am. And so why would I try and hide that? And I guess it doesn't look good when I've achieved nothing. And back then I hadn't achieved anything. And so you're like, oh, who is the shit kicker? But now I have. And so it makes it even better because you're like, oh, wow, she did come from like nothing. You know, I don't have the flashy LinkedIn profile and she still achieved what she has. And so that's more inspirational than someone who's had every opportunity available to them and has achieved what I have. So it's just another so, part of the story. It's just another part of the story. It doesn't matter. I am surprised that you've done PR training because you are one of the most natural, authentic people to speak to in, in a situation like this. We've had our own conversations, but also when we're on here, you're actually no different. I don't, well, I don't feel than than when we talk. <laughs> Probably swear a bit more. <laughs> <laughs> I also got told not to swear. Yeah, but oh really? Again, I've no. got a potty mouth. <laughs> Swear away. It makes you relatable, but I'm not a PR expert. What was the hardest piece for you to change? Is there a disconnect there? So funny, you know how like before we got on this, we we're talking about how you'd sent through questions and I said, Oh, I haven't actually looked at them because for me, it if I try and script or memorize or not speak from the heart, it actually makes things a lot harder and it makes my brain scramble. The thing with PR is is you have to go into each conversation it's usually a phone interview and no matter what question the journal asks or angle they want to write for the story you stand by what you want to go in that piece and it's usually have three really strong points and they could ask you oh you know why is that book read and you could talk about a yellow bike did you use that tactic on me like have you got three things you've been trying to talk about no 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 i'm not a journo (laughs) You're not a journal, but still, you know, like, could anything I say, this is the reality, could anything I say in this podcast come back to haunt me in 10 years time? Like that was, it was like a lot of scare tactics of like everything you push out. Like you should always think of like how in the future could this work against you? But whatever, I'm just like. God, if that happens to you, then I'm screwed too. I think I've got like. Yeah, we're all buggered. (laughs) I'd never make it as a politician. (laughs) Let's put it that way. Ah. So looking back on the Avira story so far and, you know, still relatively early, what are you most proud of so far? Two things. I would say, I mean, 100% the impact that we have on our customers. If you look at the reviews on our website, like people honestly think they're fake and you're like, this is too good to be true. And I still love, love, love reading them. Like we've got a Slack channel called Celebrations and everyone shares like customer stories, whether it's on email or our views or so on. 
And I love that. And so I'm very proud of that. And then second one, which may be more so than the first one, only because I'm seeing it constantly every single day is my team of how proud I am of how much they give to Avira, how much they believe in our mission, how much they give to me. You know, people say, oh, no one ever works as hard as the founder. You know, we've got some people in the team, they give so much to me and seeing how much, not just them, but we've all progressed as people in our learnings, but also like as humans is like pretty amazing in the short time frame that we have. That's amazing. What makes a good Ovira person as in a team member? Such a hard question to answer because we know it when we see it, but like to put it into writing is very, very hard. But I'll give it a riff. I think ultimately it's someone who's very authentic and down to earth, someone who hasn't spent too much time in corporate and is like miserable (laughs) with their job. You know, we interview people and you talk about them with just their normal life and you know they're animated and interesting and you know excited about life and then as soon as you ask them a question about work they become a robot Mm. Mm. and they they shut down and you know that's really sad to see but it's very hard to unlearn as well you know they're interested and curious about things they're open to trying anything they have fun you know people always say like our office is so loud because we're talking shit like every hour god knows what like I walked in yesterday morning and you know they were all playing would you rather and I'm not gonna say what the would you rathers were because it's very Come on. give us one give us one no I'm just gonna shout out to Nicole and say I'd really like to throw you under the bus here Nicole but I won't you know like that's so we love what we do and we also work hard and you know when we're switching off we're switching off. We're not working on weekends. We're not working outside of hours when we're rocking up to work. Like we have high output and, you know, smart people too. Like it definitely helps. That's it. Oh, optimism. So important. So, so, so important. I would say like, that's a massive one. Optimistic. You can't be in a startup and saying like, oh, that's not going to work. That's going to fail. Can't have that. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And we were talking before we press record here that you've banned the word busy. Mm, mm. everyone is in the busy olympics <laughs> competing as to who is busier and it is such a boring conversation of how are you oh so busy you oh so busy like probably busier than you yeah yeah i'm busier than you let me tell you right now and i think just the like that busy attitude leads to busy work which leads to work that isn't smart And so it's funny, someone on my team at the moment, Shanky, is like, there is a lot on and I need to ask her today to say, hey, are you okay? Because she is like working on multiple tasks that have a lot to do and are very important. And so she could easily be like rock up and be like, oh, I'm so busy, but doesn't say a word and just gets in there and does it. And so like, that's what we need (laughs) because like busy just gets you nowhere. And it's really boring, you know? What kind of words or phrases have you found that replace the word busy when you ask that how are you question? If someone asks me how I am, like I genuinely tell them, like I won't say like good or busy. I'll be like, you know, how am I at the moment? I've slept bad for the past few nights. That doesn't help. But I got asked this morning when I came in and I said, you know, I've had a bad sleep, but I'm not going to let that ruin my day. I'm here to have a good day. Let's do it. Like give a genuine answer to how you actually are. That's, I'm going to take that. I'm going to use that. That's fantastic. So good. I'll remember that, Nath, next time I ask you how you are. <laughs> oh, no, you, oh, you're gonna ca- you better not catch me on a bad day. You better not. Well, actually, everyone listening to this, and I bet it's a lot of people that you know, can all, all hold you to that standard. Yeah. You watch. I'll, I'll lose my nerve and I'll just edit this bit out. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So you painted the picture right at the start that Ovira is one really important piece for your greater mission around helping eliminate pain for women. To finish off, paint us a picture of what that mission looks like when it's achieved. I mean, women aren't suffering. <laughs> it's like really that simple, Of, but this could be in all different parts of their life, like not just their health, but in their knowledge, the way they're treated at work, like just pretty much anywhere that women are suffering is like, 
that's our ultimate goal. And so obviously, hey, we're probably never going to compete complete it, but it's how we can take a stand in so many different areas. And does that always have to be product-based? No, not necessarily. Definitely not. Amazing. Um, I love it. I love it. So, Alice, what's next on your radar for the next 12 months for yourself and the Ovira team? Uh, new products. We, in Australia, we will be launching some very, very soon in the next few weeks, maybe even by the time this goes live. We'll Eel. have them up. Five days? Just going Six on? days? Oh, nah. <laughs> maybe who knows (laughs) yeah I think it's just like continuing what we have been doing it's like constantly innovating both with products innovating in content hiring incredible people to join our team that's it like we're at an awesome place I love 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 what I do I love coming to work every day and so it's just making sure that's always the case I'm gonna finish there that's amazing Alice, thank you so much for joining us on Add to Cart. Awesome. Thank you so much, Nate. All right. If you didn't come out of that conversation thinking a little bit differently around TikTok, team building, or vaginas, I don't know anything that will shake you up. And I never thought those three things would go together. All right. Here are the three lessons that stood out for me. Number one, embrace the chaos. Are you going to change your formula for TikTok creation or performance ads after listening to this episode? Are you going to freak out your agency? Whether that be creating 30 TikTok videos in one hour, throwing away your brand guide on social, or loading up your ad channels with a bunch of lo-fi content, Alice has shared a heap of tips on how to introduce some chaos to get the performance algorithm working for you. Well worth an experiment. Number two, get on the tools. Alice is a great example of someone with the right attitude and drive who can teach herself anything, apart from development, just by getting in and having a crack. She allows some things to fail and hangs on to the gold. And that's how she got her team to where they are today. Now, I probably shouldn't say this as someone who develops e-commerce learning content uh, as part of the business, But one of the best things you can do in e-commerce is just get in and use the tools. As Alice said, it's often not as complicated as it appears, especially in those dark arts of performance marketing. Number three, no more busy. Yes, I kept that in there. I didn't edit it out and you can hold me to account. I'm going to take up Alice's challenge to not use the word busy when people ask how I am. I had started qualifying it as good busy and bad busy uh, for a while there when people asked because I am conscious of it, but I reckon I can cut it out altogether. As Alice said, it not only rewires you to think about how your day really is and what you're prioritizing and your mindset, but it actually makes you more interesting and leads to better conversations. So how are you? Anything other than busy. To get the highlights of today's episode, head on over to addtocart.com.au and sign up for our free newsletter. Each Tuesday, we will send Monday's episode summary, links and discount codes for you to go next level on. And if you're looking to explore your next e-commerce opportunity, come and visit us at eSuite. We're a dedicated e-commerce talent agency connecting the best e-commerce talent with the fastest growing brands in Australia. Head on over to esuitetalent.com.au where you can download the free e-commerce salary guide and sign up to our weekly e-commerce job emails. Thanks for listening. And until next time, keep those customers adding to cart.